Welcome to Boobs Aren't Worth Dying For, the podcast dedicated to integrative health and healing from breast cancer and breast cancer treatment using the best of conventional and natural medicine. Your host, Deborah Beaumont, is an advanced practice nurse, functional medicine practitioner, and fellow breast cancer survivor. You're listening to this week's episode of Boobs Aren't Worth Dying For. I'm your host, Deborah Beaumont. Before I get into introducing today's guest and today's topic, I just want to take a minute and thank you all for joining me today. I feel like the summer has just been incredibly busy and crazy and flown by. And I know this is a busy time for most people. A lot of people's schedules get thrown up in the air with kids out of school and different vacations and things going on. And in my case, I just moved from Hawaii to Oregon. And boy, has it been an incredible uh, journey, both mentally and physically, and a little chaotic. So I'm really pleased to be able to kind of get grounded and come back to today's show. I am really pleased to be able to continue what has been an education series around CBD and cannabis use, particularly in the area of breast cancer. I don't know about you, but it seems like it is literally popping up everywhere, particularly being in a state where it is legal. I see it literally on every corner. And like with anything, it's great that we're re-evaluating our use of it and we're learning and we're finding out that there's a lot of therapeutic benefits that we didn't know about. I don't know about you, but when I was younger, it was just a matter of getting high. And that's not what the issue is anymore. It's the fact that, that there's been a lot of research and discovery that we have an endocannabinoid system in our body. The cannabinoids in the plant have definite therapeutic benefit. If you're trying to navigate cancer, breast cancer, recovery or treatment, I think that you really need to be informed. I'm really pleased that today's guest is someone that I think is incredibly well informed and able to talk about this in a way that we need to hear as survivors. With that being said, I'm excited to interview today's guest. Kristen Walschlegel is an RN and she is an oncology nurse navigator. She has a wealth of experience working in the area of hospice oncology and palliative care and research. She has a special interest in the use of medicinal cannabis, both for symptom control and active treatment of chronic disease. And I've invited her here today to really talk about clinical application of CBD, particularly in breast cancer, and some of the things that we need to know about before we decide that this is something we want to go out and do because it's very popular. So Kristen, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, Deb, for allowing me to join you. I'm very happy that I'm able to share information that might be helpful to women with breast cancer and perhaps others in their family. Definitely. I'm really pleased that you can join us because as um, my listeners know, I'm just very aware of the fact that this is a popular topic, CBD and cannabis. It seems like it's being promoted as a treatment and a cure for everything. But as you and I have talked, I know there are some very specific things to be aware of when it comes to breast cancer. And I think that you speak about that very well. And I know that you're doing a couple of conferences this summer where you're either presenting posters or a speaker. So I'm really pleased you could make time for us. Thank you. And I'll just mention that um, I'm very happy to have been invited to present information about my nurse's experience working with patients with cancer who are also using in cannabis, and that will be at the Portland Cannabis Science Conference in August, and then I'm also presenting poster at UCLA CanMed in October in California, so I'm tremendously thrilled that I get to go and share information and learn from others. I hope to be able to see you at those conferences. So, Thank you. Um, let's just jump right in and uh, talk about the whole area of CBD and cannabis and breast cancer treatment, which I read a lot about and it's become very popular. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? I, I know that you've spoken to me about what took you into this area, but what are some of the trends and perhaps even some of the concerns that you see in the area of breast cancer treatment? Sure. Well, when two years ago, I was first confronted with a patient who had cancer, was in hospice, and we were struggling to get this lady's symptoms controlled with conventional means. One week I showed up and this lady had a little bottle of a cannabis tincture that she was swallowing. And she told me it gave her more relief than all the pills and fentanyl patches and everything we were bringing. And all it said was CBD and THC on it. And she was very protective of it. And I respected her right to use it. 
I wanted to check for drug interaction information, and I was horrified to learn that when I went online, there was nothing. There was nothing that would help me. There were no books warning about drug interactions with this or that. And so my first concern was that people were beginning to swallow these materials, and there wasn't any medical professional helping them sort out potential drug interactions. And now I look back and realize that all of the data was really around people taking a few puffs now and then to deal with side effects of cancer or cancer treatments. And no one was really looking at this because no one realized patients were going to swallow these things along with their cancer treatments or their heavy pain medicines or cholesterol medicines or whatever. And so I really became on high alert because I know that some of the drugs that cancer patients are swallowing or just someone with diabetes or heart disease might be swallowing could have serious interactions. And so I began researching and immediately became alarmed because I could see that CBD oil when swallowed has some potential to inhibit um, the clearance of some medicines from the blood if it takes if it's taken together. And nobody was talking about this. Patients might tell their doctor they wanted to use medicinal cannabis, the doctor may be open to it and tell them it was fine, but the conversation stopped there. And so a patient who might be on some oral or by mouth pills that are actually considered a chemotherapy or a special hormonal treatment, they were swallowing that at the same time as taking their CBD oil. And there were some serious concerns that either it could make the drug last longer and be stronger in their blood by slowing how quickly it could get cleared by the liver, or such as the case with tamoxifen, there was a real concern that this drug that's a prodrug, meaning the active form is only formed after it gets processed by the liver, that that might be inhibited by CBD oil. And this is a widespread use. People are using this because it helps their symptoms of anxiety, nausea, pain, you know, all of this um, inflammatory conditions. So many, many cancer patients are using this without anybody helping them check for drug interactions. And I've seen disasters happen, but they're rare, but I am concerned about that. So that became my focus, as well as just working with now over a thousand patients with cancer who shared their data, shared their drug interaction or their drug information, talked to me about bad reactions they had with certain drugs or wonderful experiences using CBD oil along with chemotherapy of this type, this type, this type. But it really rose to the top of my priorities because I realized this is a gap. This is one of the reasons doctors are afraid to recommend cannabis. They don't know this, and they know it's an important thing to consider. That was the gist of it. I have seen tremendous relief from side effects of both cancer and cancer treatments. I have seen amazing things that are not the focus of our talk today, but you know, it seems to have some synergy or increased effectiveness with certain things. But Again, the drug interaction risk was great. And then there's some other aspects of cannabis, such as the high-dose THC Rick Simpson protocols that float around on the internet that are really problematic for more than half of the women with breast cancer. Yes, that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. This is a really important thing to bring up. This is the third podcast in a series I've done around CBD. The other two podcasts that I did, we talked a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. Just for the information of of our listeners, it's been my experience that in the last couple of years, there's been a renewed resurgence of an understanding of the fact that our bodies have what are called endocannabinoid receptors that bind with CBD and THC, as well as other cannabinoids, but those are the two that are used mainly. With that new understanding, they are finding that it's treating a lot of chronic symptoms and illnesses that have not been responsive to other treatments, which is great. Except, like with anything, people are like, oh, well, a little bit is good, so more is better. I think that, as you talked about, there are some very specific things with the medications and treatments that we're dealing with in breast cancer that we just need to be mindful of. The irony is, is that many of the side effects of, like, say, tamoxifen, the pain, the um, memory issues, those kind of things are the very things that CBD oil actually helps with. But we need to be aware of that drug interaction, like you talked about. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically about tamoxifen, since that is so commonly used in hormone positive cancers. I'd be happy to. It's been fascinating. And if there was ever a case where I wish doctors were learning about the cannabinoid system that people have, this is it. 
So all of our cells have the potential to express cannabinoid receptors, especially numbers one and two, CB1, CB2. These are just like if you picture little satellite dishes that stick up sometimes from a cell surface. Otherwise, they're retracted or down within the cell membrane and they're not exposed to chemicals. Our brain cells have both CB1 and CB2 receptors on them. CB1 receptors are all about nerve conduction, neurosignaling, mood enhancement or otherwise, appetite suppression or stimulation, how do we forget scary things at night and are managing to go to sleep. There's so much more, but the CB1 receptors are main targets when we're needing to adjust a nerve issue or a brain issue. And that's where we see side effects of drugs like tamoxifen because we just recently learned 2013-2015 in laboratory work that tamoxifen binds in kind of a bad way to this receptor. And it may be contributing to mood difficulties, anxiety. Um, Some women describe it as a rage that they got divorced or lost their job or wrecked their car because when they started tamoxifen, they had this really bad anxiety and depression. Some women have gotten locked up on three-day holds for psychiatric um, evaluation because they told their doctor they were suicidal. And these were women who were on tamoxifen and they were being told they just needed to toughen up, that it's just hormonal and if they want to live, they have to take it. Right. And the concern is that number one, doctors don't understand the endocannabinoid system first. So they don't understand why the new information that tamoxifen may be binding in human bodies in this way, especially the brain, could be linked to the cognitive changes. Then there's another receptor called CB2, which is used by cells to um, control inflammation, for example. Some of the tamoxifen side effects can definitely be linked to the estrogen actions that tamoxifen does. There is CB2 receptors on any cells that are needing inflammation control. And when the inflammation has done its job, whether that's fighting an infection or an injury, The cannabinoid receptor number two is often activated or expressed, triggering the body to use that to turn off the inflammation when the benefits are done. And tamoxifen binds in such a way that it may be interfering with that. So now we have possible mood effects, possible sleep problems because of it. We might be dealing with some serious psychiatric challenges that I think women should be aware could be a drug side effect that they need to tell their doctor about versus just menopausal symptoms like they get lumped into. But the inflammation could be something like, why do we get so many cataracts with tamoxifen use? Why do we have what we call cognitive decline or executive cognitive function impairment, which means our ability to decide what we're going to do today, how we're going to answer a question, how we're going to balance our finances or do our high-powered job. Maybe we're a surgeon, maybe we're a truck driver, and we start having trouble with that. We feel like we're forgetful, we're losing our mind, we're just not able to think clearly. This is sometimes being linked to neuroinflammation. Now again, cannabinoid receptors are very involved in controlling inflammation throughout our entire body and brain and eyes and colon. I mean, it goes all through our body. Mm -hmm. Amoxifen is an unusual drug, and I actually now tell doctors when they say they're not interested in, in prescribing cannabis. I said, well, do you ever prescribe tamoxifen? And they look at me funny. They go, of course I do. So, well, did you know that it's actually interacting, it looks like, with all of the cannabinoid receptors in a woman's body? That sometimes opens up a communication. But the other thing I want to mention right now is that tamoxifen is a pro-drug, which means the pill that women is, are swallowing requires processing by the liver by something called CYP450 metabolism. And that needs to happen for tamoxifen to get changed into its more active form that is actually going to provide anti-cancer benefits. And tamoxifen is processed through the liver through multiple CYP450 pathways. And all of those pathways that are listed on a tamoxifen um, informational label can all be inhibited by things like CBD oil in high quantities or THC in high quantities. So theoretically, a woman could be dealing with side effects from her tamoxifen, swallowing cannabis oil, which helps her with her tamoxifen 
tamoxifen and side effects, but could also be interfering with the effectiveness of her tamoxifen, something which she won't know is happening until her breast cancer recurs, perhaps. So mm-hmm. when we see this, you know, people say they feel better when they use cannabis. I will say that inhaled cannabis does not appear to cause the drug interaction risk as great at a great level because when we inhale it, it goes right into our lungs. The cannabinoids travel in the blood to various areas of the body and brain. And then eventually some residue of it gets processed and cleared by the liver. But this is quite different from people swallowing cannabis oils, which is ironically the way we're encouraging patients to use this because we don't like the idea of smoking. But sometimes if someone has tamoxifen as one of their medicines that's important in their protocol, I actually mention if they were using a swallowed oil that they might want to talk to their doctor and see if they could recommend inhaling it like through a vaporizer pen or a vaporizer device, things like that. And they have inhaled CBD as well. Um, Just to clarify, CBD is one of the cannabinoids that does not cause the effect of being high, the way we associate that with THC. They have CBD that can be inhaled as well. You know, but like you, it's like, but that's still inhaling smoke into your lungs. But I think individualizing and customizing the approach. There are some women who choose not to do tamoxifen for a number of reasons, and and yet there are women who are using it, I think would be very interested in how to get some symptom relief. The one thing that I really want to highlight from what you were saying, this is one of my biggest frustrations as a practitioner. And when I talk to people, this is something that comes up very frequently. If you are having these cognitive changes or what they call brain fog, what the doctors are, might dismiss as chemo fog, just a result of your treatment, the fact is, is it's very real. You're not hysterical. You're not making it up. You're not a hypochondriac and you should not be dismissed. These are very real side effects of these medications. And even if you choose to take them knowing that what you're experiencing is normal and expected can take a lot of the fear factor out of it, thinking that you're losing your mind. And if you're seeing a practitioner who is not respecting you when you try to talk to them about these things, then that's not the practitioner to keep seeing. That's excellent advice because one of the things I noticed was women in support groups would talk about these side effects and symptoms, yet when encouraged to let their doctor know, they said, well, I don't want to tell my doctor I feel suicidal because I'm afraid he'll lock me up, or I don't want to admit how bad this is because it makes me look weak, or there's something wrong with me. So once I teach them that it might be a side effect of a medicine, that it's acceptable to do this, and I send them some research papers that explain tamoxifen side effects that they can share with their doctor, and then I encourage them to be honest, but if it's not working out with your doctor, then you need a different doctor. But hopefully... You don't walk in with an argumentative approach. You just go in and say, doctor, I've been experiencing this. I didn't want to say anything because it was embarrassing to me or I was afraid you'd think there was some behavior that I was, you know, inappropriate with or just weak or whiny. But doctor, it's really getting to me. It's affecting my relationship. It's affecting my um, quality of performance at work, my relationship with my children. This is getting serious. And I've now learned that this, I'm not alone. There are other women experiencing this. And doctor... We're not talking about a little bit of back pain or a little bit of arthritis showing up. We're talking about serious depression or serious anxiety or serious forgetfulness. And I'd really like to talk to you about this. And I will go so far as tell you that I spoke with the FDA in February because I realized they didn't seem to be aware of this. And I contacted them. They were fascinated with the new information about cannabinoid receptors They are not as up to speed as they should be, but they promised they would look into it because I had research done from more than 10 years ago where the FDA had considered a drug marketed from Europe that did what appears to be the same thing to the CB1 and CB2 receptors, or at least CB1, the one that controls mood and appetite. It was a drug that bound to those receptors in a way called an inverse agonist. And bottom line is, they had to pull this weight loss drug off the market because multiple people had suicidal tendencies. One committed suicide. Others had rage and had car crashes. And they decided the psychiatric risks were too great for any possible benefit they had on appetite suppression. 
And so when I shared that research that was from the FDA's own files, where they had been presented with this data back in times past, that's what got their attention. I said, now look at the research showing tamoxifen may be doing that for some people. We don't have human data that's actually in a clinical trial about this, but there's obviously a, a need to look at this fresh, freshly. And I just suggested that they consider adding these severe side effects as a possible rare side effect so that doctors would begin to talk to their patients about it with more compassion and more seriousness. Well, that's the thing that I find frustrating and difficult is that in the whole scheme of things, you may determine that this is the path that you want to take, either this or aromatase inhibitors. But the fact is, is that these drugs have side effects and you need to know about them in order to make an informed choice. And all too often, doctors are not really forthcoming with that information and they're very dismissive or they're so trained in what we call the standard of care that nothing is going to move them off the fact that they're prescribing these drugs and they're just, they have serious effects for some people to the point where I know many women who have decided that it's, it's not beneficial for them to have a quality of life so diminished by the medication that they're taking. Well, one of the greatest risks that I see happening is some data recently summarized that over half of all tamoxifen pre, uh, prescriptions, women stop using it well before they were supposed to. And many women shared with me that they would go through, pick up the prescription and never take it because they didn't want to get in trouble with their oncologist. Now, my concern is these women who should be doing something to control their hormones are now not doing anything to control their hormones. If they have hormone positive or sensitive breast cancer, there is a standard option that does not bring with it these additional side effects. They just bring menopause symptoms, which we can deal with. And that is an option of uh, ovarian suppression using something like um, gazarelin or luprolide called you know, Zolodex or Lupron. These are standard care options and they're actually being found to be superior in women who still have their ovaries, are still before menopause, especially if these women have a high risk subtype of breast cancer, something like a grade three breast cancer on pathology report or HER2 positive is a big one for me. I really, really dislike tamoxifen in that group in that group. But this is becoming a standard recommendation that ovarian suppression using an injection of Zolodex or Lupron appears to yield better results for women when it comes to their cancer. And many women have switched from tamoxifen to an injectable ovarian suppressor. And they tell me, well, sure, I feel menopausal. I went through my hot flashes, just like any woman does. But my goodness, I can think better than I did on tamoxifen. So I'm not anti-tamoxifen for those women who are on this because they have a low grade, like one or two breast cancer, and they have the most common form of breast cancer, which is highly estrogen and progesterone sensitive and not HER2 positive. These women may do just fine on tamoxifen as long as the side effects are not bad. But if they don't like tamoxifen, they need to speak with their doctor. If they don't like the way they feel, speak to the doctor because the doctor could easily switch them, at least for a trial period, onto these injectable ovarian suppressors. And these will cause a temporary episode of menopause. If you use the one-month version, then you go through menopause for a month, and you'll go with the hot flashes, and you don't want to just say, oh, I can't do this. You've got to do something to block that hormone if it's really a serious breast cancer, um, and you're making lots of estrogen. We've got to do something, because that's the other tragedy I see, is women not doing anything, and a year later, they have it uh, recurring, and they thought their DIM or their IC3 or something was going to block it because someone told them it would, and it didn't. The main thing is remember, patient, you know, ladies, you've got options. Your doctor can recommend ovarian suppression, and he may actually be more appropriate if he recommends it, but he may not know the latest updates from the large oncology groups that are starting to send out bulletins. Hey, your young women with aggressive breast cancer should be placed on ovarian suppression instead of tamoxifen alone. And then when women are over menopause or they had their ovaries removed or they're on ovarian suppression, aromatase inhibitors add an additional estrogen reduction, which they may or may not want to pursue. But it, it 
also will cause menopause symptoms to seem stronger. But again, it does not seem to cause the same cognitive issues, mood issues as severely as tamoxifen does. I have a handout talking about some of these very common side effects, just because I think it's so important for women to be informed about what the side effects are so that when you're experiencing them, you you have some information to go on. Uh, it's very frustrating to me that doctors can be dismissive or nonchalant when, when women are talking about these very serious effects of these medications. And as you said, the biggest problem with either tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors is compliance because these side effects are so significant that a, a good number of women do not complete treatment the way it's recommended anyway because they're so miserable on the medication. Exactly. People are always discussing, oh, I'm going to take a tamoxifen break. I'm going to take a tamoxifen vacation. And so again, we need to have better communication, better knowledge. And the reality is, after studying this, after speaking to researchers, after really looking at the biology of all of this, I realize that if someone has permission or recommendation or they decide to use cannabis for their side effects or symptoms, inhaling a puff or two of some cannabis that contains both CBD and THC or even just high THC oil may give them some relief from some of these symptoms. And that's what I hear over and over. So I don't want doctors or patients to be afraid of using cannabis in low levels this way, because if it gets them through their treatments successfully and they're getting some help with their side effects, I will tell you that that's important. And low doses, meaning a couple puffs, a couple times a day of cannabis, either smoked or inhaled with a vaporizer, or using tiny doses of three to five milligrams of THC in a cannabis oil will probably do quite a bit to help them with some of their arthritis pain, anxiety, insomnia. And the important thing is just to remember, especially if they're swallowing it, this in high amounts, meaning more than 75 milligrams of CBD per day, um, possibly more than that of THC, which is a really large amount of THC and yeah. unlikely to be used. But I'm encountering this over and over. I talked to a 70-year-old lady last night who's taking 125 milligrams of THC per day and didn't know that was a large dose because she built up over a couple of months and someone told her that was a good idea. And so now she's tapering down because she was having some really bad reactions to an antidepressant drug. And I showed her the research. She was a retired nurse. And suddenly she realized this could be causing a side effect from her anti-anxiety medicine. Every time I do this, I come away thinking, gosh, I'm glad we talked about that. So again, little doses of cannabis, little doses swallowed, not appearing to be a problem. It's when they start using more than 75 milligrams of CBD a day that I've been witnessing some of these interactions develop on blood tests where we can see the effects or they have symptoms that match um, what might be side effects of a drug that also warned against use with things like grapefruit <laughs> right. because CBD inhibits the same pathways as grapefruit juice can. So I mentioned the grapefruit um, when checking for interactions on your drugs. But there are other interactions that really need to have a discussion with your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your pharmacist. And those interactions can be um, looked at by your pharmacist or nurse practitioner or doctor by telling them that CBD could inhibit CYP2D6, also CYP2C19, as well as CYP3A4. Now, these are three pathways that a lot of medicines get processed through, especially CYP2D6. We see a lot of drugs that get processed through that pathway in the liver. CYP3A4 is the biggie. That's your cholesterol pill, your blood pressure pill, your eye brands, uh, oral chemotherapy drug. Uh, tamoxifen gets processed by several of those pathways. So the CBD oil in large amounts could inhibit all of those pathways. And if you're writing this down, then write one more thing down. P-glycoprotein transport. Your doctor will appreciate knowing that. Once you provide that information to your doctor, then he or someone in, the, in your healthcare team can help you consider should you be using this with your pharmaceuticals or not. In the case of some medicines, it might mean the doctor has to reduce the dose down if you're really getting some benefits from your CBD 
but that requires a conversation and a lot of people are afraid to do that. But I encourage open communication. Unfortunately, a lot of doctors aren't going to have this information. They're still operating on some old ideas about cannabis and pot. Not every doctor is going to be informed in this area. So that's that's why it's good to be able to consult people like you or people who are clinicians in the field, get some clarity around this. Even the doctors. I mean, if you go to your doctor and they don't know anything about this, you know, they may need to actually do some work instead of just dismissing this as a treatment option. Because as we talked about, one of the biggest problems is non-compliance. So if you're having so many symptoms, you're not taking the medication anyway, that's a huge thing that they need to know as well. Absolutely. And just to be complete, let's go ahead and round this out by making sure that we talk about uh, THC. Because a lot of people discover, especially as we get older, or especially as we're dealing with nausea or arthritis pain or neuropathy that we developed after we went through chemotherapy or just because we had a back injury or something, THC and the raw form of it that the plant makes called THCA, before it's heated, it's called THCA. Once it's heated, it's called THC the chemical changes slightly. That drug in high amounts can thin the blood. It can also inhibit CYP2C9 and uh, CYP3A4, which could be a really big deal because some people are put on blood thinners because they had a blood clot. Well, guess what? Warfarin or Coumadin, a commonly used drug, could become much stronger if you're taking it with a lot of THC. The other thing that I'll mention is that inhaling a little bit of one of these cannabis preparations can give you immediate but shorter acting relief. Swallowing it means that you won't begin to feel the effects for maybe 45 minutes to an hour, but the effects will last perhaps 5 to 12 hours, depending on your particular body. And one last thing I'll say to make sure it's in there Swallowed cannabis oils appear to absorb better if they're taken before a meal, not after. And if they are taken before a meal that has at least some dietary fat, like olive oil or avocado or walnuts or something like that, there was some recent research that was just published this year that clearly showed absorption was enhanced. And that allows you to start using it more consistently and having a more predictable outcome. So inhaled options are considered more of a quick uh, quick relief type option. Swallowed options, you have to be careful because someone might eat a dose or swallow a dose of something with THC in it and not realize it could take an hour or two before the effects are felt. And they might accidentally double or triple their dose thinking, this isn't working. And suddenly, two hours later, they're laying on the floor going, I can't stand up. I feel so dizzy. And I don't want anybody to experience that. But the nice thing is people usually within a couple of weeks, if they have enough guidance or they got lucky, they'll find a Goldilocks dose that really gives them symptom relief without making them high. THC does not make someone high unless they use too much. Some people purposefully use quote unquote too much because they're looking for some specific reason they and their healthcare team uh, you know, set as a goal, that will make you high, but most people use that medicine about an hour before bedtime, so they sleep through it. But there are fall risks that can be, um, you know, considerable. So I always coach people with that. THC, famous side effects are dizziness, dry mouth, slowing your thinking, forgetfulness, dizziness, your blood pressure can temporarily drop down, especially if you're getting out of bed at night to go to the bathroom, your blood pressure may stay low and just not respond as quickly. To As soon as you stand up, you could feel dizzy and pass out if you used a lot of THC. CBD side effects are much lighter. In fact, almost unnoticeable by many, but there are in a typical CBD oil that's well-made, there could be, say, 25 milligrams of CBD in a dose that comes with a milligram of THC. That's where people get um, confronted with something called a ratio. A 25 to 1 ratio oil made from cannabis means 25 times more CBD than THC in that liquid. And so that is the kind of cannabis oil that I call CBD oil that many people use for daytime symptom relief. And then they might have a second product that has a higher amount of THC. Sometimes they go for an indica type THC oil that has maybe 10 milligrams of THC per milliliter, meaning there's 10 milligrams of THC floating in one milliliter of the liquid. 
Um, that's a key point that people struggle with understanding. So milligrams are the measurement of the THC or CBD in the liquid. The milliliter is the measurement of the liquid it's floating in. So people might count drops, they might count um, using a syringe, but either way, you want to start getting comfortable reading a label and becoming familiar with that because a two milligram THC dose is quite different from a 20 milligram THC right. dose. Right. In the world of breast cancer and all the different permutations, are there times when you want to focus more on a CBD based product or on a THC based product? Or are there reasons you would not want to focus on those? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a really important point. And there's a lot of, in, of information on the internet and even among doctors and nurses that's very confusing and actually misinformation. So I learned all of this the hard way. I joined some support groups two years ago and I began to witness what was going on in the real world without anybody really helping to sort this out. It's, it's something it's difficult to speak about because I know I'm, I'm sharing information that might be controversial. But in the world of cancer care, at least 80% of patients are asking their doctors about medicinal cannabis potentially having anti-cancer effects. And this is because there is really strong evidence that some cancer cells may be vulnerable to things like THC and CBD. And what I learned by focusing on this deeply, talking with researchers, is that CBD appears to have strong potential in pretty much, I'll be careful and say most forms of cancer, but it does end up requiring pretty high doses of CBD. That might mean for a typical middle-aged woman, they're using 100 or 200 or even 300 milligrams of CBD per day. So you can see the drug interaction potential is huge. Then we have THC that really needs some careful consideration because I use THC by mouth every night before I go to sleep because I have rheumatoid arthritis, I have autoimmune uh, disease, lots of inflammation. My immune system misbehaves and I have a bad back, I've had spinal surgery and I have nerve spasms that really were causing me insomnia and nightmarish um, problems at night. I use 30 milligrams of THC swallowed at night because my doctor and I watched my blood work and found that my autoimmune disease markers came down. My helper T cell numbers came down when I used that dose week after week. My overall wellness improved. However, I was actually suppressing an aspect of my immune system when I did this. And these helper T cells, that THC especially, will be potent, potently acting on to actually influence my immune system to not create so many helper T cells also means that if I had breast cancer that was not vulnerable to THC, that I would be allowing for faster tumor growth if I continued to use 30, 40, 50, or more milligrams of THC per day. Now, why is this a big deal with breast cancer? Well, women with breast cancer who have the most common form of breast cancer that is considered estrogen sensitive, progesterone sensitive, and with zero HER2 activity were also the women's women who have a type of cancer that researchers believe is least likely to have good targets for THC if we're thinking about an anti-cancer potential. And the scientists who wrote these papers always put a warning that not all cancer cells will be vulnerable or equally vulnerable to THC. And you may find that one researcher did research on a hormone-sensitive breast cancer cell line in a dish, and when they dribbled THC on it, it worked. It killed those tumor cells. Well, remember, breast cancer is not one disease. You can have some cells that might be sensitive to THC and others that aren't. And this is complicated. And over and over, when I joined the support groups, I found many women were being told by, you know, well-meaning individuals that, hey, this worked on my lung cancer. Why don't you do this high-dose THC protocol, which could be 500 or 600 milligrams of THC a day. Wow. And they would painstakingly suffer through adjusting and increasing this dose. And suddenly, just yesterday, someone joined and I happened to be in one of the groups reading and this lady said, oh, my tumor markers, which had been stable for six months, suddenly doubled this month. And of course, you know, I asked her her pathology details. She had estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HER2 negative breast cancer. And here we go. 
her tumor markers jumped. Thankfully, she was in the group. She had just joined and all these women had messaged me saying, Kristen, can you help this lady? Because they know I'll jump in and try to help give good advice if possible. Um, on the other hand, we had women when I joined that support group um, last year who literally were stage four with cancer in their bones and they were using this and being told to use more and more and more by well-meaning individuals and bones were breaking. I mean, mm -hmm. this is really serious and this applies the same caution around THC and immunosuppression applies to the raw form of THC called THCA and that is becoming very popular because that can be accessed by um, juicing cannabis leaves or flowers or you can buy tinctures made with this and it's a lovely help for anti-nausea purpose anti-anxiety bone pain neuropathy pain insomnia pain anxiety but it also is easy to take a lot of it because people don't get so high from it and they'll end up using two three four times as much and two women who had been already cautious about THC because they had tumors grow faster when they tried Rick Simpson protocol. They were using a couple hundred milligrams of THC a day and within six weeks they could see their tumors growing and one woman had a, a scan done and there was a 40% increase in under two months. And as soon as she stopped using THC, the tumor slowed down and she went to just a high CBD dosing that she worked out with her doctor and her tumor started shrinking and later, her tumor started growing again. And when I privately talked with her, she had started using THCA. She thought it was like free calories. You can just use as much as you want. And gosh, I feel better. But then her tumors were growing again. And again, we backed down. So anybody who tells you differently, please know that I'm not saying this recklessly. I'm doing this because I know that we need to talk about it. And the last thing about um, this is we're going to see a lot of immunotherapies and clinical trials for breast cancer, especially forms like triple negative breast cancer, coming soon to someplace near you. And immunotherapies are being used to try to allow a woman's body to actually ramp up their helper T cell production so they can attack tumors and they're trying to inhibit some chemical the tumor secreted that otherwise made the helper T cells not able to kill the tumor. So if they're on a, an immunotherapy drug, and a couple names of those are um, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, some of these are called Keytruda. These drugs really should not be used with high-dose THC unless you really have a purpose with your doctor and they understand this might interfere with those helper T cells they're hoping will get busy and start attacking the cancer. And I know I'm talking a lot, but I really think it's important to make sure before our time ends that there is a new pill form of uh, targeted therapy, they call it. It's called Ibrance, Kiskali, right. Kiskali's mm -hmm. another one, Abemacyclib. These are really important medicines for thousands and thousands of women who are surviving with breast cancer that has metastasized or has become uh, treatment resistant in other ways. And some are now being put on it early. And these drugs have side effects on the liver and they also can um, knock down certain blood cells. And so women on these drugs are routinely getting blood tests and being told, oh, hold your dose this week because your neutrophil count dropped down. That's a kind of white blood cell that fights infection. And they all have warnings on the label to not take with grapefruit. And I have witnessed drug interactions where women became dangerously ill using these and CBD oil in large quantities and I'm very concerned about that because doctors will routinely push the envelope. They'll put the women on the highest dose of this drug that they can tolerate without knocking out their uh, blood cells or um, causing their liver blood tests to go abnormal. And then a woman gets a bottle of CBD oil given to her or purchased, and she starts using it for weeks until she gets her next blood test, and suddenly disaster strikes. And I just want to heighten awareness that CBD oil with these drugs can be safely managed if the doctor knows you're taking it and understands this. They can reduce the Ibrance dose if they want to down to what the, the prescriber um, recommends. They always say that if someone must use something that could inhibit CYP3A4, then the doctor might choose to start their Ibrance dose at a lower level. So good communication is important and caution is 
really reasonable here. Krista, you just have so much amazing information. And I definitely want to have you back to really explore this in more detail. But uh, this is one thing that I really wanted to at least touch on because I've been reading, it's all, it's not all created equal, but unfortunately, with the popular upswing of CBD and THC, it's it's easy for people to think it's a panacea for everything. And there isn't anything that's a panacea for everything. And I think a lot of these things are things that we need to really be aware of. You know, and as I mentioned, not all doctors are into studying this. So that's why there are those of us who are interested in delving into it more specifically in this area of breast cancer. And you brought up a really good point, even separate from other cancers, there are specific characteristics of breast cancer that we need to be mindful of. So even though it may be helpful for another form of cancer, it it just doesn't necessarily transfer over. Because as you said, there's, there's so many things going on in a breast cancer diagnosis. It's not just one disease process. Many, many things that we need to be focusing on. So I thank you so much for this. If people want to find out more information, how can they contact you? Sure. The most dependable way to contact me is by emailing me, actually, because I'm a one-woman show when it comes to answering contact requests. And my email that is really just focused on this is um, Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, at nursekristen.com. And I do have a very, very basic website where I basically just have my photo and my contact information at nursekristen.com, or I have a Facebook page that's titled Nurse Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N. Thank you, Deb. Oh, thank you. And this has been so helpful. As always, there will be show notes with a lot of this information Christian shared so much. Our listeners can definitely access that. They've got your contact information and you can always contact me, Deborah, at RadicalHealthRN at gmail.com. So thank you for joining us today. This has been great. There's so much more to talk about, but I really hope this is giving you some key pearls of information to either help you figure out if you want to look at this or if you are in the process of using this to augment your own treatment, give you some ideas of things you might want to be aware of to talk to your practitioners about. One of the things I definitely like to just do another whole show on is really some of these drug side effects that you talk about because it does affect so many other drugs that people are taking. And um, I'd love to have you back to discuss that in more detail. Thank you, Deb. I really look forward to it. I really appreciate this opportunity to share information and I look forward to, um, you know, the next opportunity. Great. Thank you so much. To our listeners, thank you for joining us. Please reach out to Kristen or myself with questions or comments. Until next week, take care. You can always reach me at my email, which is RadicalHealthRN at gmail.com. And you can also find me through my website, which is www.MindBodyNutritionRN.com. There you can find show notes that will have a lot of the information we talked about today. You can also find a free e-guide that I've written that talks about tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors and some of the normal and expected side effects of those medications. You can also schedule a complimentary consult if you're interested in looking at approaching your own recovery with an integrative and functional medicine approach. I actually work with women by phone and by video across the country. I actually have some clients in other countries. So I do provide coaching and consulting to women who are interested in incorporating this in their treatment plan. And if you have any questions, please drop me a line. Until next week, take care and enjoy this last month of summer. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. If you have questions or feedback, you can reach Deborah at RadicalHealthRN at gmail.com or her website, www.MindBodyNutritionRN.com. You can also find us on Facebook under Boobs Aren't Worth Dying For. For future episodes, subscribe on iTunes, where you can also leave positive reviews. Until next time.